we have the capacity to solve these problems, but we have to look through one really, really important lens. And this is what I would ask as people look at all the new things being served up. Are we looking to control nature better than we have? Mm -hmm. Or are we looking to partner with nature better than we have? Welcome to Facing Future. Our guest today is Larry Kopald. He is the founder of the Carbon Underground. Each year we pump 30 to 40 billion tons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, accumulating some trillion tons since industrialization began. Much of it the result of agriculture. We have to draw that down. No technology on earth can match the capacity of the planet itself to sequester all that carbon. Trees, healthy soil, and biodiversity are essential. Photosynthesis is critical, as is changing the way we farm. At its root, the climate crisis demands that we nurture healthy soils filled with living organisms. The carbon underground is trying to do just that. Welcome, Larry. Can you tell us a little more about yourself? Hi there. It's great to be here. Uh, yeah, my, uh, my path is uh, somewhat unusual. I grew up in the advertising business. Uh, I was the creative head of advertising for uh, McDonald's and American Express and Nike and Coke. Uh, and it, it sort of did a wonderful job of teaching me communications and motivating people and, uh, and, and the, the way business works, which is critical to what we're doing today. I, I sort of moved on from there after a long and, and uh, really wonderful experience. And, and I got into social change and I created one of the first change agencies. And uh, we've worked a lot in the, the utilizing the same types of tools that advertising uses to communicate to people, but, but really factoring in um, social change to it, positive impact on the planet. Uh, I'm a senior fellow at the business school at USC for eight years under Obama. I was on the White House panel on social innovation. This is stuff mm -hmm. I, I live and breathe. And about 10 years ago, I was on the board of Greenpeace. We were at a Greenpeace board retreat in Costa Rica. And uh, the climate news being given to us by some of the experts was as bleak as one could imagine. Mm -hmm. They all said we have 15 years left and there's nothing we can do. It was already past the tipping point. That was 10 years ago. And, and after that meeting, I was introduced to this new data that was starting to just emerge around the world that there might be a relationship between soil health and climate change. And it's something I had absolutely never heard of before and had been working in climate change, being a big environmentalist and being a lot of big boards. Uh, for a long time. And, uh, you know, I'll leap forward now. We do know that there is a direct relationship between the health of our soil and the health of our atmosphere and our planet and our water systems, and not just carbon. And so we created the Carbon Underground. And our mission was to restore the depleted, degraded, dead soil around the world, which the UN estimates could be as high as 70% right now of our topsoil. And, and by the way, they also say that at the rate we're destroying it, uh, we have at this point about 50 harvests left and we won't be able to grow food. So there's also that uh, nice little element. Well, doesn't that depend on the location? Um, you know, in different places, there's different capacities of the soil. It, it's such a, a large figure to come up with uh, globally. Yeah, well, it... it I mean, yes, of course, there are differences and there are some places that are healthier than others. Uh, but when you have a, a statistic like 70% of our global topsoil is dead or degraded, um, that's a pretty, pretty broad paintbrush that the UN is talking about. And, uh, you know, we, we look at the 5 billion hectares that 12 and a half billion acres of land used primarily for growing food around the world. And the soil is decimated. In fact, I mean, if you look at the 
you look at the Great Plains, for example, the soil used to be 100 feet deep and now it's 18 inches deep. It's just gone. We've destroyed it, it washes away, it takes all the chemicals into our rivers and our lakes and we know the impact of that as well. So that brings us to the agricultural methods we've been using, which are monocultures, chemicals, and growing most of it, most of our crops for uh, feeding cattle and, and other uh, animals that we eat. So the, the big shift that everyone wants to make is to find f less farmland, more biodiversity. And, uh, you know, for, for me, the critical thing is, is to stop having animal agriculture. Um, if we've grazed animals, we can't feed that many people with them. It becomes a food for um, wealthy people. Um, but if we grow plants directly, legumes, uh, et cetera, we can have enough protein and we can feed many more people and we can harm less of the land. <laughs> so I assume that that's what you would like to do as well. We have to find the best possible solution at this point. Yes and no. And, and uh, I don't eat meat. And uh, I don't eat meat for health reasons. I don't eat meat because I feel it's an inefficient food source, to your point. Mm -hmm. uh, that being said, and again, my path, my journey has been pretty interesting to run McDonald's advertising and tell <laughs> everybody to go eat hamburgers and then join the boards of Greenpeace and NRDC and other you know, groups like that and tell the world, don't eat beef. And now I'm out there saying, you know what? There's this amazing book by Judith Schwartz called Cows save the planet and and the truth of the matter is for our land to remain healthy we have to work with nature and nature has ruminants and that's the role that cows play today and and i'm not saying anybody has to eat them but if we don't return the, the animals and the impact of animals to our land we're never going to keep it it's just not the way. I guess it's a question of which animals, uh, you know, biodiversity also wants animals on the land, wild animals of all sorts, and their predators. Um, biodiversity wants to keep uh, nutrients on the land. If you have cows and you're harvesting them for food, you are actually taking nutrients away from one place and transferring it to another place. Um, sure, and but that's, true for plant, that's true for plants as well. I live in California. We grow half the produce for the United States. We're in a massive, massive drought and we're exporting all our water. It's yeah, yeah. very complicated. This is not a simple solution. No, it, it, I grant you that, which, you know, me also we're moving to a different climate. So whatever we plan for, we have to plan years ahead. We have to understand, you know, if it is like the Dust Bowl, you know, when they didn't understand what they were planting there. And then I was surprised it's dry in this area of the world, you know, and we know it's drying up. Uh, so we need to figure out ways that can hold the water in the soil. So far as real easy way to do that, restore the, the health of the soil. Here's an amazing statistic for every 1% of carbon levels that we restore in our carbon, in our soil, every 1%, the soil will store 25,000 gallons of water per acre. Yeah. It, because you're creating more humus, it creates more of a sponge. And, and you create this water battery. So imagine every time you're growing a crop and you're irrigating and you need 25,000 gallons less per acre because it's there. And by the way, it will continue to grow food when there's no rain. So, so you know, again, the restoration of soil has a myriad of astonishing benefits. We do this. Oh, definitely, definitely. Well, you know, the soil, the soil is the basis of every ecosystem, of course. Um, and some soils request are more peat, bogs, incredible wetlands, uh, huge amounts of soil. Forest soils also store large amounts of carbon. And it, 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 it's area based. You know, there's no broad brush that we can apply across the world and say, we got to do this here. And we have to look at every single area separately and kind of create a, I don't know, a catalog of what are the soils, what are the conditions, where are we going here and here and here. It's incredibly complex, as you say. Good news is we have an army of people to help us get that data. There are 500 million farms on this planet. Think about that for a second. 500 million. And there's 2 billion people that are involved in growing our, growing our food, not manufacturing, just growing our food. 
So, so the, the opportunity for us to get that input is you're 100% correct. What works on my land might be different than works on the guy across the street or, or, or the, the hill on the other part of my property. And, and so you're 100% right that the, the more we understand the, the intricacies of each area, each crop, each weather pattern, all of how these things work together, the more efficient we're going to be at uh, restoring and maintaining. Right. So we have the subsidies that are coming not only to fossil fuels, but to through the Farm Bill and in the United States and in Europe, they have their own subsidies, huge amounts of subsidies going to a very small percentage of the people. Very often those people are not even people who are farming, but people who own land. Um, so, you know, redirecting the subsidies to the best possible practices is a major part of the challenge. And the Farm Bill, I think, is coming up soon for re- Yes, it, every five years. On the farm every farm. five years, yeah. And, and um, it's interesting. We were on a call this morning on subsidies in uh, the EU. And the good news is there is some major, major shifting going on in how they're approaching subsidies. And they're talking about a trillion dollars ultimately in subsidies. You know, that starts to get to real money. Uh, you know, we're still in the tens of millions of dollars for similar types of programs being subsidized in the U.S., mm -hmm. tens of billions. Uh, and so it's, it's, it can be a lot, but it's not, it's not nearly what we need. Uh, but you're right. I mean, it's, it's a question of who is it that we're subsidizing and probably more importantly, what is it that we're subsidizing them to do? Because a lot of these subsidies uh, continue to make the situation worse. Not better. Well, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> so if we were to uh, switch our subsidies, figure out the best uh, thing to do in each place, uh, then we have this idea of the carbon offset. So people can buy carbon offsets for their industrial pollution or whatever. And some of that has worked well. Some of it has been simple greenwashing. Some of it has gone to projects that already exist and don't need to be subsidized, land that's already been saved, for example, in some cases. Um, you know, what's going on with this carbon offset? Is it a good thing? Will it work? Um, it's a very complicated question. And it's one that I have some very strong opinions on. I'm, sometimes I'm off to the side with my opinions. I think that that it, you know, if you happen to see John Oliver's piece on, on offsets recently, um, which is getting a lot of discussion, you know, pro and con, uh, I think there was a lot of truth in that. And I think that let's start with the very basic premise: I pollute. I don't stop my polluting, but I pay somebody else not to pollute. M maybe. In some worlds, that makes really good sense. And I understand carbon budgets and I understand you know, carbon systems, but we're in a situation right now, you said it at the beginning, we have transferred a trillion tons of CO2, primarily from our soil, from our land into our atmosphere. And that's why we have climate change. That's called legacy carbon. And, and if we reduce emissions to zero, today to zero. And as you said earlier as well, we're still putting 30 or 40 billion additional tons in every year. You know, all this work that, that the cops have been doing and we've all been doing, the problem is still getting worse. It's not turning around. And the thing about offsets is that it, it, we need to go to a carbon negative behavior. We need to operate in a way that pulls that that legacy carbon back down and puts it back into the soil or going to zero emissions does zero. Those are the two halves of climate change. And so focusing so much on emissions, and by the way, you're not really even netting out in a neutral standpoint if you're still polluting and you're paying somebody else not to cut down a forest that's already been protected Where's the net benefit in all of that? So what we like to focus on much more are carbon insets. And the, the, the distinction being that, that 
An inset is an actual, based on what you're doing, it's drawing that carbon back down and putting it back into the land. And so if you're a company and you're polluting and you put 10 tons of carbon up in the atmosphere, but you pay somebody to do some activities, restore soil, for example, plant trees, for example, that will pull down 10 tons. Okay, okay. At least you're stopping it from getting worse. And by the way, then when you go to 11 tons of drawdown, you're starting to reverse the problem. And we can do that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, assuming the projects are bona fide. <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, you know, verification is very important these days. And, and you yeah. know, the good, good news is there's uh, wonderful companies that are doing it. We're involved in all kinds of research to help identify and, and validate the movement of carbon. Okay. Um, so you, you say you are working with certain businesses and there are certain companies that you think are, can be helpful in this process. We can actually take companies that are making money and, and have them make money in a different way. Is that going to be viable and where is it working? Well, I hope it's going to be viable um, or, we're, <laughs> or we're in trouble and we're, we're in trouble regardless. We're in trouble. Uh, and we know that we see it around us every day. Uh, the food industry is the biggest industry on the planet, entirely dependent on the health of agriculture, right? And, and I, I'm really excited when I see the actions, the changes, the transitions that some of these very large companies are doing to get away from destructive, uh, you know, degrading industrial practices of as you said, you know, uh, the tilling the soil and, and monocropping, only growing one thing, and pouring chemicals on it and, and trying to replace what nature does. It doesn't work. And a lot of these companies are, have realized this. And, they, and so when we started out, and again, my, my co-founder at the Carbon Underground, uh, Tom Newmark, both of us come from the corporate world. We both come from the world of big business, the world we understand. And so what got us excited was the fact that the biggest industry in the world was going to benefit from this. Keep climate change out of the discussion. And as a business, they're going to benefit from transitioning to doing things in a, in a different and better way. How does that work? Well, number one, if you go back, you don't have to go back 10 years. You can ask them today, how's, how's the front end of your supply chain doing? How, how is the availability of ingredients, the predictability of where they're coming from, the predictability of pricing or quality, all of that, especially not just with the degradation of soil, but with climate change? Mm -hmm. How do you run your business? And every one of them will tell you it's really hard. And how do you how do you how do you do your your business planning and your financial planning for the year, not knowing what you're going to pay for your your key ingredients? It's really hard to do. So, so we walked in through the business doors and we said, if you shift to a practice that keeps the front end of your supply chain healthier, your whole supply chain will benefit from it. And they all get it. They don't, you know, they all, uh, you know, all of a sudden they're saying uh, that the, the stress that their farmers are in, their producers are in around the world is, is pulling down their company's ability to do what they do. And, and these companies will tell you that. So, so from that standpoint, it, it, it props up their supply chain health, but it does something else. When you are subsidizing uh, your farmers by paying costs that include their ability to buy chemicals, right? Uh, their ability to buy water for irrigation. And, and there's, obvious costs, not just environmental costs, but there's financial costs in that. And you restore the land and all of a sudden, guess what's happening? You don't yeah. need those chemicals. You don't need those pesticides because nature takes care of it when it's healthy. All of a sudden, your, your own input costs go down dramatically. So it's, you know, it's a little bit like, you know, 93%, I think last time I looked, 93% of Fortune 1000 companies have invested a million or more in some sort of renewable energy. Why? Not to help the climate. 
it's a good investment. It has a tremendous return. This is completely the same thing. Invest to restore the health of your soil and the health of your farmers and the health of your supply chain, and you will reap the benefits from that point on. Well, the thing is that only a few companies um, run the food industry and they're big and they have the big systems of monocultures and farm equipment and the chemical companies and the genetically modified seeds and the whole game that goes on and allowing more glyphosate. You know, uh, they don't want, <laughs> oh, you know, if we plant well, we don't need pesticides. Well, we make pesticides. So they're going to fight. They're going to those big companies are going to fight it. Are they not? Well, uh, look, uh, sure, in the corporate world, decisions are made that might not be the same ones we would like to have made at times. But what I can tell you from our 10 years of experience is that massive leadership, massive investment, commitment, and actual change is coming from those companies you just talked about. Mm -hmm. It's just that simple. I mean, there are there are food companies that are committing a billion dollars to transition to regenerative practices for all the reasons I talked about. OK, so that would mean end of monocultures, diversity yeah. of crops, yeah. Yeah. Uh, planting yeah. of cover crops, yeah. keeping the yeah. soils covered, all of those kind of essential things. Um, I think, you know, it's, it's very exciting that what you tell me, if that if this is what's happening, um, you know, what Buckminster Fuller famously said, you don't change a system by attacking it. You, you change it by creating a better system mm. and people will move to it. What's happened in the food business, and I, and I use the happened, mm -hmm. is that they've realized there's a better system. It's that simple. They've realized there is a better system. The train has left the station. This transition to growing food in a different way, in a way that allows soil and, and the farmers and the producers to stay healthy is something that the food industry is moving to very broadly. What they're not doing is they're not moving fast enough for us to get the benefits before the window closes on climate change. So much of what we do is we are now working on Okay, so now that now that the knowledge is out there, and by the way, we need lots more data, and we can talk about that, and how that's mm -hmm. being worked on right now. But but now that people understand there's a better model, how do we accelerate the rate at which they transition? That's what's going to save the planet. That's what's going to you know prevent existential climate change. Although we may be there right now. Well, I have to come back to the fact that we're using eighty percent of our agriculture to grow crops or graze animals to eat and that this incredibly unwieldy system is wasting you know we need 10 times the input to produce a pound of animal flesh as we need to produce legumes beans you know directly for people so i mean to me this is like the the basic fact of uh, the transition to stop the animal agriculture and also in the oceans of course where we, where we need the oceans to recover their kelp and their you know uh, all of that system, we we have to just take a break here, folks. You know, you've enjoyed all your stuff, but let's stop it for a while at least. Uh, and, and we can't provide anyway meat for everyone if we go to grazing animals. It, it take too much land. It would take too much water. So we need everyone. You know, we need a diet that's equitable. We need a, a, a diet that's sustainable. Let's start right there. And and you know the issues you're bringing up. You know, we can't export a Western diet to the world the way we've been trying to do for the last quarter of a century because we see the impact of how it's happening. And, and I, I agree with you that even though the, the fact that we got to get animals back on land where we've taken them off or we've replaced them with, with cows being raised in, in destructive ways, uh, we can't do that at scale, right? We can, you know, so, so you know, we have got to figure out there's going to be some meat in our diet, no question. And, and you know, we have to figure out a way to do that in a way that, that, that keeps the land healthy. You know, I, I, I'm not going to make a decision on what you should do about your own health, but, you know, I've made that decision for me. But, but you know, even, even that is starting to transition. So if you look at the amount of people who are plant-based or more importantly, the offerings of food that are plant-based. Mm -hmm. you, can, you can 
satisfy your whole diet right now. Yes, absolutely. When You'll you have a healthier that. life as well, because we know that meat causes you know, problems, it's carcinogenic, it causes diabetes, it causes obesity, you know, clogged arteries, heart disease. Uh, you know, we're much better off eating plants from a health point of view. <laughs> uh, you know what, I, I read the China study, all 700 pages, it's pretty profound. Yeah. Yes. Uh, um, and, and it's an interesting book to read lying on the beach in Hawaii as people <laughs> come up and go, wow, what, what are you reading? <laughs> and get into some great conversations. But but even in the production of meat, I don't know where it's going to go, but there, you know, there is a, a a large investment and a lot of work being done in cultured meat, right? Yes. And and you know what? Uh, just foods, eat just. They are now selling uh, in certain countries where it's already been approved, cultured meat, where they've just gone in and you take a cell from the muscle mm -hmm. of an animal and you you replicate the cell. It's all you do. And, yeah. and I believe that that's going to be a part of the food supply. It's not gonna I, I agree with you. I, th I think that that's possible. Instead of going through the body of an animal, it, it, it gets grown in a laboratory. And we might think, oh, this is Franken food. But actually, it's probably a very good idea compared to what we're doing now, where the thing goes into an unhealthy situation with antibiotics, et cetera, et cetera, and then is slaughtered. Yuck. <laughs> Let's yeah. take the, the cells and grow them. Yeah, you know, much better if you must have some animal protein. Well, here it is and in a much cleaner. efficient. And you're right, cleaner. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. again, we are in probably the greatest transition period in human history because the systems are global. The problems are global. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, when you, when you have a thing like COVID, and the world shuts down, it reminds us, and this is one of the wonderful benefits of COVID that we're seeing and we're involved in a lot. It reminds us that we can't protect ourselves as a community because we are utterly dependent on globalization. And so communities and cities around the world are sitting there saying, we have to become more resilient. Mm -hmm. And one of the key ways that you become resilient that you must do is you have to be able to feed your people without a ship coming across the Atlantic Ocean or, you know, something like that. So, uh, you know, I think this localization of food production and which, which bleeds into the health of the environment and the community, I think is a, is a really good thing, but it's complicated. Yeah. Well, in cities, you know, there aren't, there isn't enough land around the cities to be that local, you know, you have to bring in food from some distance away. New York City, can you imagine? You know, well, you know, <laughs> what, that, you know yeah, farms. But, but, but still, upstate New York has a lot of spectacular farmland. You know, yes. LA County, I live in LA, we have a million acres of vacant land. Now, we don't have any water to grow anything with right now. But yeah. Let's assume someday we do have that again. Mm -hmm. There are, and, and you know what, even if you're growing or producing 10% of your food locally, it, mm -hmm. it, it helps. It helps. Oh, me. sure. Yeah. I mean, people could have gardens, people that have rooftop, uh, you know, rooftop gardens, all kinds of possibilities are, are, are available to us. And we should look at them all, I guess. Um, and, and the joy of growing something yourself right? absolutely yeah and how wonderful it is to eat fresh food <laughs> it's just that you picked that that moment yeah. well larry thank you so much for being with us today um it's been a pleasure to talk with you and uh you know to hear i'm sure there's many more things of, of, that carbon underground is doing and i hope that people will go and look at the site and see what you're up to so, you know i'll just i'll say this one thing which is um we have the capacity to solve these problems, but we have to look through one really, really important lens. And this is what I would ask as people look at all the new things being served up. Are we looking to control nature better than we have? Mm -hmm. Or are we looking to partner with nature better than we have? We're never going to win against nature. So I don't care how much you put in a cow's feed to stop them from methane. It's never going to work long term. Mm -hmm. And by the way, if you restore the soil, part of that biodiversity includes methanotrophs in that soil mm -hmm. that will eat all that methane. So 
partner with nature. Yes, absolutely. You ever ask for. I can't. I can't agree with you more. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Larry. Good being with you. Good being with you. Bye bye. Bye.